Hello and welcome to this video. This is a video in my series on box tempo practices. This video here I'm making right after the one I explained top box tempo matrix. So uh, what I've done so far is I've explained my Bach tempo theory and how I came up with it in 1992 and the evolution of that theory. And in the next video in the series, I explain Bach's system of tempo that belongs to a matrix of mostly integers or whole numbers. And I explained how this is the, the only perfect or mathematically ideal or perfect uh, matrix of numbers that can be found, whole numbers. And in this video, what I want to do is I've, I've talked uh, so far, I've mentioned one to one ratios, one to two ratios, and two to three ratios. And in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little about Bach's Prelude and Fugue in B flat minor from book one of the Well Tempered Clavier. And I'm going to play it. It won't be a formal performance all the way through, but I'm going to talk a little about the prelude, play it through, talk a little about the fugue, play it through. And, and, and so it's an informal performance, okay? It's not a concert performance. And uh, I'll be messing around with the metronome and so forth also. So this is a kind of a workshop style video in which I'm going to show you how to apply this apply these numbers in the matrix to box works. And I'm going to show you how I do it to this prelude and fugue and what that means for performance. So before we do anything, what I want to do is uh, this tempo matrix is a little different than the one I showed you um, uh, in the previous video. I've actually added a couple of rows on the slow end. And I had to do this to accommodate this B flat minor prelude. And that's okay because it's it, it can go infinitely faster and infinitely slower. Well, not infinitely. It's good. If it goes too slow, we'll get to zero. But uh, anyway, you can add a couple of slower rows up here so there's slower families of tempi. There are rows and there are columns. Each row represents a family of tempi and each column represents the um, acceleration or the new the new family of tempi like it goes I have basically adagio up to presto and approximately in the way that Bach probably would have thought of those words and his styles so before we do anything what I want to do is I'm going to hold this up close to the camera and I want you to just pause the video for for a couple seconds and screenshot this screenshot what I'm holding up, and then print it out. It's really that easy. Just screenshot it and print it out, and then you can follow along with me. Okay, so I'm gonna hold this here. Screenshot that. Good. Now I have one more sheet here I want you to screenshot. <clears throat> screenshot that. And there we have it, good. Quick and painless. So we have box. Uh, so what you need to do is print those out and follow along with me now. So I don't have to keep showing you the, showing it to you. So what we have is we have columns and each of the columns has a different type of uh, division of the notes. We have one note, we have two, we have three, we have four, six, and eight. And the families of the tempo go across. And what I've put here <clears throat> is uh, adagio to presto. So ad adagio, and the, the first adagio up here on the line where it says 126 is the first number, that could be an adagio assai or a very a molto adagio. So both of these, it's not contradicting. I'm not contradicting it by putting adagio on two lines. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, we can't, you can't, it's not all cast into stone. Some adagios are a little faster than other adagios. Not all adagios are exactly the same speed. But roughly speaking, box adagio or adagio size were pretty much the slowest kind of tempo. Perhaps graves 
I didn't put grave here, but I did Bach used occasionally, he'll use a grave. Graves are also very slow, so that could be, I could have actually put grave in that first line, but it goes down the line. So you have adagio, sort of the adagio category is the slowest. Then it goes down into the largos. Largo is uh, slow, but not really, really slow. <laughs> and then after that, you get to andante. And I put uh, andante over a couple of lines, a couple of family of tempos here, which I would consider to be around uh, somewhere around andante. And then after that, moderato. And Bach used tempo words like this a lot in his chamber music, like the harpsichord and violin sonatas. He used it a lot, but in his solo keyboard and organ works, he really didn't use it very much. Occasionally he did. So uh, anyway, just because he didn't use these terms in the well-tempered clavier all the time doesn't mean that he didn't think of them as belonging to one of these categories. So one of the, the things we have to do is, and one of the things that I've done over all of these years is I've, I've tried to play musical uh, detective and try to really determine what style this movement belongs to, whatever it may be. So we have moderato allegro, box sort of default allegro that I think would fit probably 70% of the time in a 4-4 allegro, say a typical 4-4 allegro is uh, 84 beats per minute in terms of the groups of fours. So if you have 4-4 four, four with 16th notes and it's just a plain allegro, chances are it's probably 84. Then vivace, box use of vivace was usually, usually it tends to indicate a faster, a little faster speed than allegro. I have found through studying box music that the Alleg vivace is usually a little faster than allegro. It's, it's what I refer to as like an Italian allegro. I think <clears throat> that Italians such as Vivaldi tended to use faster allegros than Bach did. And I would, I would tend to usually go to the vivace category for that. And then we have the presto, box presto, and then perhaps prestissimo could be after that, but it's very rare that you find tempi faster than that or faster than presto in box music. So if you have, say, let's say a piece in 4-4 time with 16th notes and it's presto, which in box, there's, I, I don't even, can't think of anything in 4-4 four, four with 16th notes that pre that's presto with Bach. But there is like the third movement of the Italian concerto is one of the ones that's presto. But, you know, give or take a couple rows, presto doesn't have to necessarily always be in that family of tempi, the one that says 432 for one note. But generally speaking, this is about how they break up. So, uh, you know, you have to play around with it a little, but generally speaking, Adagio to Presto, this is sort of the hierarchy of box tempi. And, and I mentioned in the uh, last video of The Matrix that there are about a dozen families of tempi that Bach worked with on a regular basis for his standard operating procedure. And I have here count one two three four five six seven eight nine ten yeah I just made just to keep it consistent I made 12 rows to show you a dozen different tempo families and that the two the extremes the extreme slows and the extreme fasts probably you know the first couple rows up above and the and the last couple rows below are very rare actually in box music. So if you're if you want to figure out box tempi, it's most of them tend to center around the middle area, around the six rows or so towards the middle of this matrix. Anyway, let's get to the prelude and fugue. So the the second uh, sheet that you screenshotted 
was a sheet here where I call it my sort of a reasoning sheet or my, lo my sheet of logic. And what this is, is okay, if, if you've seen the previous videos and you need to watch the previous videos so you understand what I'm talking about here, is that uh, we're assuming that Bach was a musical architect and that he controlled the number of measures he composed and he knew his tempi in order so he could control his, the number of measures so he could attain certain duration ratios. So that being the case, the first thing we need to do when trying to make sense of or determine tempi for Bach is count the number of measures. I cannot overemphasize that. Count the number of measures. I spent about 10 years counting all the measures in Bach's complete works. I know it's a total nerdy thing to do, but I did that and I analyzed things and relationships between numbers of measures and I started to see patterns in his music. I think you'll be really amazed about this prelude and few, about what it means for performance. So the prelude goes like this. That it's a very slow piece, <clears throat> okay? Very slow. I would definitely put it in the adagio category. Definitely somewhere probably in those first two lines. Okay, I've, I've toyed around with about three different tempi for this prelude over the years. Um, always, always tempi that are, that are in the matrix. And uh, this, this is a slow enough tempo to where it belongs in the, in the column that has twos. Because it, it's slow enough to where you're subdividing the quarter note beat. Adagios are almost always subdivided if they're in common time. So if you have a 4-4 four, four adagio, of course he didn't write adagio here, but it's in that style, clearly in that style. If you play it by the eighth note beat, as most performers do, rightfully so, then what you have is each beat consists of mostly two notes. Da, 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 da. So you have so you want to go to your, so the tempo for the prelude, for this B flat minor prelude, is somewhere there. Now let's say if it didn't, let's say if you had to go slower, let's say if it had to be slower than 63, that's okay. That's okay. Then you would simply check the column that says 4, and you would look to see what's slower than 63, which would be 54 and 48 or 42. So the, in general, what I'm saying is the twos and the fours are the same, are the same tempi. So you have, if you have to go slower than this 63, simply see what is slower than 63 in the four column, which would be 54, 48, 42, 36, one of those. Okay, so the tempo will be somewhere in either this column or this column, the two or the four column, for the prelude. And the prelude consists of 24 measures. <clears throat> I have an addition which counts the measures, but I know that anyway. 24 measures of 4-4 four, four time. And if you if you go 24 times eight, okay, remember what there, the eighth note is the beat, not the quarter note. So 24 times eight is 196. So we have 196 eighth note beats in the prelude. Okay, 196 eighth note beats. Now let's look at what happens in the few. Now we haven't determined the tempo yet, so we're, we're not, we're not going to be so concerned with that. Let's look at the fugue. The fugue has 75 measures of 2-2. Two, two. This means that the half note is clearly the beat here, but it's a pretty slow half note beat. But half there are 150 half note beats in fugue. Now let's look at these. 
we have a beat for the prelude and a beat for the fugue. And we have a certain number of beats in the prelude and fugue, <clears throat> which Bach achieved by the number of measures that he chose for those pieces. Now, look at it, just look at it logically here. Okay, so let's go to step one of my logic chart here. If the eighth note in the prelude is faster than the half note of the fugue, this results in a 1-1 one, one duration ratio, or it has to be so much faster. So it not, it's, it's not just any, a bit, any bit faster, it has to be a certain amount faster for that to happen. But you can see that that it's very, it actually works out really very reasonable because most people, I think most performers would probably tend to do that anyway. They tend to, uh, let's, let's try it. Okay, let's, let's try it. I'm going over here. Uh, okay. I, I have an online calculator here. Usually, uh, metronome. Usually I use my metronome on my phone, but I can't, uh, I can't do that. Okay, so I'm gonna put it on a beat here. And I'm gonna play the prelude with this beat. speed. By the way, Andras Schiff plays it at almost exactly that speed. Now I'm not saying that Andras Schiff is, is, knows anything about Bach's tempo practices. I, I, actually he doesn't because <laughs> I, I think a lot of his tempi are way off. Actually that's a, that's a topic of another video but my opinions on modern performers, famous performers, is that yes, sometimes they get things right on, but often they're, they're off, they're way off. So, but I'm just mentioning that, that I was, I looked this up and the first thing that came up was Andra Schiff's recording of it, and I said, oh, <laughs> look at this, I was amazed when you, I, I said, it's almost to the, exactly almost 63, that and that's why I had it on, 63. So what I'm using for the prelude, I'm playing the prelude at 63 beats per eighth note here. And that's the one I chose. About 20 years ago, or even less than 20 years ago, I think I, I would have chosen a faster speed. Like I used to play it at 72 or maybe even 84. But I think through, through the years, I've just sort of gravitated towards a slower speed as I discover more and more about Bach's other works. Anyway, we have 63 for the, hat, for the eighth note of the prelude. Okay, now let's put it on 63. Let's just experiment. Let's try that same beat for the half note of the fugue. just clearly too fast. I think most good musicians would just say that's, it's just too fast for that. So clearly this step one reasoning, if the eighth note in the prelude is faster than the half note of the fugue, this results in a one one duration ratio. Well, that's true. We, we don't know yet how much slower the eighth, the the half note of the fugue will be yet, but we know this, we know they're not equal. Okay, so this step one premise is true in the fact that the fugue should most definitely be, have a slower half note speed than the eighth note in the prelude. Okay, pretty much all performers do that instinctually. It's not a revelation of any kind. So step one, that's done with. Step two, 
determine reasonable tempi from the matrix. So we've done half of that already. Okay, we've done half of that. We've chosen 63 for the prelude, 63 for the, half, for the eighth note of the prelude. Works very well. Even Andras Schiff does it. Okay, what could be better than that? 63. Now, what's the next step? Well, step three. We have to look at the, step three says that eighth note equals 63 for the prelude. <clears throat> and here's the big question here. How much slower would it require to take, the, remember the number has to come from this matrix, to a number from the matrix that would make these two equal in duration, or at least close, the closest you can come to equal as you can, and that's 48. So if you use, if you go here, on the column with fours and find 48, that's somewhere around what Bach would consider around a largo speed, perhaps on Dante, uh, maybe a slower on Dante, somewhere in that area. So the prelude is an adagio, or what I would call probably an adagio assai, or an adagio molto, and the fugue is um, a little, actually a little faster when you consider, if you count the quarter note for the fugue, the quarter note of the fugue is faster than the eighth note in the prelude, however you want to look at it. But if you do the math, and, and here's, here's where the math comes in. If you do the math, what you do is, and uh, this is the topic of a future video of doing the math and how I make charts for these and everything. But if you take 24, if you take 24 times eight for the prelude, remember that because the eighth note is, is the unit of measurement. So 24 times eight, divided by 63. 24 times 8 divided by 63, you get 3 point something. Actually, that decimal, you multiply that decimal by 60 and it gives you a second. So, so if, here, 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 here it is. If you play the prelude exactly at 63 with no rubato or anything, it just a, you, it should last three minutes and three seconds, okay? Three minutes and three seconds. Be Bach got as close to three minutes as he possibly could, actually, because if, if it had considered, consisted of 23 measures, he actually would have been, I believe, like under three or so. So this is as close to three minutes as he could have possibly achieved it. 24 measures, three minutes and three seconds. Now, the fugue, if you take 75 times two, because the half note is the beat, there's two of those, 75 times two divided by 48. 75 times two divided by 48 equals 3.125 or something like that. Actually, when you, when you take that decimal and multiply it by 60, you get three minutes and eight seconds. Okay, so what I call the, the sort of the absolute value of the absolute value, the sort of perfect mathematically correct duration for this prelude and fugue is three minutes and three seconds and three minutes and eight seconds. Now, that raises a red flag. That is a huge red flag huge. Okay, this, this is the epitome of my, of my tempo system here. Look at, look at the fugue now. Bach composed 75 measures. Now, what, what would have happened if he would have composed three measures fewer? If he had 72 measures for the fugue instead of 75, 72 times two divided by 48 is exactly three. He would have achieved three minutes. So my theory says, step four, this suggests Bach was aiming 
for 24 measures in the prelude. That's the closest he could have gotten to three minutes using his standard tempi. And 72 measures for the fugue, 24, 72, to achieve equal durations of three minutes. Equal durations of three minutes. And what's really amazing and what made me really happy was when I listened further to Andras Schiff's recording, I think, I didn't listen to the whole fugue, but I looked at his durations, and I think he does the exact same thing also. So this is not radical stuff. This is not, I'm not claiming that everybody's, everybody in the world is playing this prelude and fugue too fast or too slow or whatever, uh, but all I'm saying is that Bach, based on this evidence, wanted the prelude and fugue to be equal at three minutes. Now, why did he compose th uh, three measures more in the fugue, which only amounts to like, you know, seven or eight seconds? Well, Bach was not a machine, okay? He, he was a human being. So when he drafted out the, the whole so, sort of macro plan for this prelude and fugue, it's, it's very obvious to me, at least, that the prelude, he, he probably said to himself, okay, I want the prelude and fugue to both last three minutes, equal three minutes. And so he basically just took his most common tempi for these styles, and then he determined the number of measures that he would have to write in order to achieve three minutes. He didn't have to sit there and time himself. He didn't play these, put on a stopwatch, and time them. He would have. He would. He didn't do that. He actually composed backwards. He knew his tempo. Then he determined the number of measures to to compose to achieve that relationship, and then he composed the music with the goal in mind to shoot for that number of measures. So in the fugue, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal at all that he was three measures off. Three measures is lasts this amount of time. Just that's like seven and a half seconds or whatever. I rounded it off actually to eight. It's like seven, three point seven point something seconds. So rounded it off. So it's not a big deal that he was off. In fact, this happens all the time. But when you look at the average margin of error, it's very small, very small. Actually, you know, and I'll, I'll get to this in future videos, but when I tally up all my analyses of box complete works, I think, I think I actually spent, I spent years doing this. And I remember once I tallied up hundreds of works at their margins of error, and it was only like 2.5%. 2.5% difference per, on average for, for pieces. Sometimes he hits it exactly. Other times he's like maybe one or two or three measures off. Occasionally he's maybe five measures off, six measures off, but you can see patterns in his music that makes it very highly likely and I think very obvious through my analysis that Bach wanted that, those, those durations. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking. You're probably sick of hearing me talking. And I'm going to <clears throat> play these. I have a stopwatch here, <laughs> okay. So I'm going to, I'm gonna test this out. I'm gonna just put the metronome on for a few beats. And then I'm going to put the stopwatch on. I'm going to play the prelude through. I didn't practice this that much, but it's one that I think I can play all the way through. And then I'll stop it and see how close I get. My goal is three minutes or maybe with like a nice retard at the end, maybe three minutes and five seconds or something like that. Okay, so we'll, we'll try this. Okay, so stop launch.
Okay, well, two minutes and 56 seconds. 256. I could have maybe gone just a tad slower or maybe stretched out some retardando, like when you when you have the fermata here, you have. And I could have maybe taken a little more time there, whatever, but it was really close. My goal was about three minutes, or maybe a little over three minutes, maybe at the very most three minutes and five seconds. I, I wouldn't, anything that's over 3.05, I think is out of that range. So I did really well, actually. 256. You might want to try that. See if you can do it. See how close to three minutes you can get at playing this prelude. Andra Shift comes very close to that too. Now let's go to the fugue. Okay, the fugue. 48 beats per half note. So if you play exactly at 48 with no rubato or anything or, or retardandos, it should last three minutes and eight seconds. Seven or eight seconds. So my goal here is, of course, the same as the prelude. Maybe around, I'd be happy with three minutes. I'll be even more happy with a little tiny bit over three minutes. Okay? So we're gonna, I'm gonna go to 48 here. <clears throat> Okay, stopwatch, okay.
I went a little over. I went a little excessive on the slowness. I got 318. So what I would do if I made a recording of this, okay, if I made a recording, I would um, I would redo it. I would I think that's too a little too slow. So I would redo it. In fact, that's that's what I do in my recordings. I especially in Bach, you know, if it if it, if it really exceeds the the ideal speed, I'll redo it. So let's just check. I'm going to put this on 48. I'm going to play a little bit with the metronome and see how I could see how it's different than what I just did. Yeah, it's 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 virtually the same as I did. But if you have a good ear, you would have heard that that I was just falling a little below that, just a little below that. So anyway, this is my theory. This is my theory. I think that Bach planned this prelude and fugue to last three minutes long each, to be equal at three minutes, and that he happened to go a little bit over in the fugue because he was a human being. He was not a robot. He couldn't get everything exact all the time. But you can see by playing musical detective what Bach's goal was in this prelude and fugue. So I will argue, I, I will argue until the day I die <laughs> that this prelude is 63 per, per eighth note and the tempo of this fugue is 48 per half note. It's nothing other than those. Those are the correct tempi for this prelude and fugue. If you want to try to try to uh, challenge me on that, I'd like to see your reasoning that it's anything other than that. So, um, and 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 I think we'll be we were happy. I, I was really happy that Andras Schiff pretty much did that too. So Andras Schiff comes, you know, one of the great Bach performers of our day, uh, seems to agree. I, I know that he didn't do it intentionally or you know subconsciously or anything but uh, his decisions here in this prelude and fugue at least were good I think and that it supports my theory so three minutes three minutes three and three so thank you for joining me for this video and stay tuned for more videos like this in this series